The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So last time we started talking about superfluid helium, and uh, we said that the phase diagram of uh, helium-4, the isotope that is a boson, uh, has the following interesting properties. First of all, helium stays a liquid all the way down to zero temperature because of a combination of its light mass and weak interactions. And uh, secondly, that if we were to cool down helium uh, through this process of evaporative cooling, one immediately observes something interesting happening at temperature below 2 degrees Kelvin, where it becomes this superfluid that has a number of interesting properties. And in particular, as pertaining to viscosity, we make two observations. First of all, uh, you can make these capillaries, and I'll show you the movie in more detail later on, where it flows through capillaries as if there is no resistance. Uh, and there is uh, nothing that sticks to the walls of the capillaries. It flows without viscosity. Whereas there was this experiment of Andronikashvili in which you had something that was uh, oscillating. And you were calculating how much uh, of the helium was stuck to the plates of the container. And the result was something like this. That is, uh, there was uh, a decrease in the amount of uh, uh, fluid that is stuck to the plates, but it doesn't go immediately down to zero. It has a kind of form such as this that I will uh, draw more uh, clearly now and explain. So what we did last time was to note that uh, there were people observed that there are some similarities between this superfluid transition and Bose-Einstein condensation. But uh, what I would like to uh, highlight in the beginning of this lecture is that there are also very important differences. So let's uh, think about these uh, distinctions between Bose-Einstein condensate and uh, superfluid helium. Okay, one set of things we would like to uh, take from the picture that I have over there, which is uh, the fraction of uh, the fluid that is stuck to the plates and in some sense behaves like a normal fluid. Now, when we make the analogy to Bose-Einstein condensation, we note that in the Bose-Einstein condensation, uh, there was also this phenomena that there was a separation into two parts of the total density. And we regarded as a function of temperature some part of the density as belonging to the normal state. So when you are above Tc of n, everything is essentially normal. And uh, then what happens is that when you hit Tc of n, you can no longer uh, put all of the particles that you have in the excited states. So the fraction that goes in the excited states goes down and eventually goes to 0 at 0 temperature. And essentially, this would be the reverse of the curve that we had in that figure over there. Basically, there's a portion that would be the normal part that would be looking like this. Now, the way that we obtained this result was that basically there was a fraction that was in the normal state. The part that was excited 
was described by this simple formula that was g over lambda cubed zeta of 3 halves. So it went to 0 as t to the 3 halves. So basically, the proportionality here is t to the 3 halves. And then basically, the curve would come down here and go to 0 linearly. Now, what is shown in the experiment is that the curve actually goes to 0 in a much more sharp fashion. And actually, uh, when people try to uh, fit a curve through this, the curve looks something like tc minus t to the 2 thirds power. But also, it goes to 0 much more rapidly than the curve that we have for the Bose-Einstein condensation. Indeed, it goes to 0 proportionately to t to the fourth. And so that's something that we need to understand and explain. Now, all of the properties of the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate was very easy to describe once we realized that uh, all of the things that correspond to excitation, such as the energy, heat capacity, pressure, come from this fraction that is uh, in the excited state. And we can calculate, uh, uh, say, the contribution to energy, heat capacity, etc. And in particular, if we look at the behavior of the heat capacity as a function of temperature, for this Bose-Einstein condensate, the behavior that we had was that, again, simply at low temperatures, it was going proportionately to t to the 3 halves, because this was the number of excitations that you had. So these two t to the 3 halves are very much related to each other. And then this curve would basically go along its way until it hit Tc of n at some point. And we separately calculated the behavior coming from high temperatures. And the behavior from high temperatures would start with the classical result that the heat capacity is 3 halves per particle due to the kinetic energy that you can put in these things. And then it would rise, and it would then join this curve over here. Now, when you look at the actual heat capacity, indeed, the shape of the heat capacity is the thing that gives this transition the name of a lambda transition. It kind of looks like a lambda. And at Tc, there are divergences approaching from the two sides that behave like the log. And again, more importantly, what we find is that at zero temperature, it doesn't go to zero, the heat capacity as t to the 3 halves, but rather as t to the third power. So the red curve correspond to superfluid. The green curve corresponds to Bose-Einstein condensate. And so they are clearly different from each other. So that's what we would like to understand. Well, the thing that uh, is easiest to understand and figure out is the difference between these heat capacities. And the reason for that is that we had already seen a form that was of the uh, heat capacity that behaved like T cubed. And that was when we were looking at phonons in a solid. So let's remind you why was it that for the Bose-Einstein condensate, we were getting this uh, t to the 3 halves behavior. The reason for that was that the various excitations I could plot as a function of uh, k or p, which is h bar k. They are very much related to each other. And uh, for the Bose-Einstein condensate, the form was simply a parabola. 
which is this p squared over 2 mass of the medium. Let's say, assuming that uh, what we are dealing with is uh, uh, non-interacting particles with mass of helium. And this parabolic curve essentially told us that uh, various quantities behave as t to the 3 halves. Roughly, the idea is that uh, at some temperature that has energy of the order of kp, you figure out how far you have excited things. And since uh, this form is a parabola, the typical p is going to scale like t to the 1 half. You have a volume in three dimensions in p space. If the radius goes like t to the 1 half, the volume goes like t to the 3 halves. And that's why you have all kinds of excitations such as this. Okay, And the reason for the Bose-Einstein condensation was that you would start to fill out all of these uh, uh, excitations. And when you were adding all of the uh, mean occupation numbers, the answer was not coming up all the way to the total number of particles. So then you had to put an excess at p equals to 0, which corresponds to the ground state of the system. <coughs> now, of course, when you look at helium, helium molecules, helium atoms, have the interactions between them that we discussed. In particular, you can't really put them on top of each other. There is a hard exclusion when you bring things close to each other. So the ground state of the system must look very different from the ground state of the Bose-Einstein condensate in which the particles freely occupy the entire uh, box. So there is a very difficult story associated with figuring out what the ground state of this combination of interacting particles that make up uh, liquid helium is. What is the behavior? What's the many body wave function at zero temperature? Now, as we see here, in order to understand the heat capacity, we really don't need to know what is happening at the ground state. What we need to know in order to find heat capacity is how to put more energy in the system above the ground state. So we need to know something about excitations. And so that's the perspective that Landau took. Landau said, well, this is the spectrum of excitations if you had point particles without any interactions. Let's imagine what happens if we gradually tune in the interactions, the particles start to repel each other, etc. This non-interacting ground state that we had, in which the particles were uniformly uh, distributed across the system, will evolve into some complicated ground state. I don't know. And then presumably there would be a spectrum of excitations around that ground state. Now the excitations around the uh, non-interacting ground state we can label by this momentum p. And it kind of makes sense that we should be able to have a similar label for excitations around the ground state of these interacting particles. And this is where you sort of need a little bit of Landau's type of insight. He said, well, presumably what you do when you have excitations of momentum p is to distort the wave function in a manner that is consistent with having this kind of uh, 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 excitations of momentum p. And uh, he said, well, we typically know that if we have a fluid or a solid and we want to impart some momentum above the ground state, it will go in the form of phonons. These are distortions in which the density will vary uh, in some sinusoidal or cosine way across the system. So he said that maybe what is happening is that for these excitations, we have to take whatever this interacting ground state is, which we don't know uh, and can't write down, but hope that excitations around it correspond to these distortions in density, and that by analogy with what happens for fluids, 
that the spectrum of excitations will then become linear, you would have something like a sound wave that you would have in a liquid or a solid. So if we do this, if we have a linear spectrum, then we can see what happens. Uh, for a particular energy of the order of kT, we will go here, occupy momenta that would be of the order of kT over h bar. The number of excitations would be something like this cubed. And so you would imagine that you would get a heat capacity that is proportional to this times kB. And if you do things correctly, like we did for the case of phonons or photons, you can even figure out what the numerical prefactor is here. And there's, sorry, there's a velocity here because this curve goes like h bar uh, vp. OK? So then you can compare what you have over here with the coefficient of the t cubed over here. And you could even figure out what this velocity is. And it turns out to be of the order of 240 meters per second. Okay. A typical sound wave that you would have in a fluid. So that's kind of a reasonable thing. Now, of course, when you go to higher and higher momenta, it corresponds to essentially shorter and shorter wavelengths. You expect that when you get wavelengths that is of the order of uh, uh, the interatomic spacing, then the interactions become less and less important. You have particles rattling in cage that is set up by everybody else. And then you should regain this kind of spectrum at high values of momentum. And so what? Uh, Lando did was he basically joined these things together and posed that there is a spectrum such as this that has what is called a phonon part, which is this linear part where uh, uh, energy goes like uh, h bar, uh, like the velocity times the momentum. And it has a part that in the vicinity of this point you can expand parabolically, and it's called rotons. There is a gap delta, and then h bar squared over 2 some effective mass, k minus k0 squared. This k0 turns out to be roughly of the order of the inverse spacing. It's two angstrom inverse between particles. This mu is of the order of uh, mass of helium atom. Okay. So about, I don't know, 10, 10 years or so after uh, Landa, people were able to get this whole spectrum of excitation through neutron scattering and other scattering type of experiments. And so this picture was confirmed. OK? So, yes? Uh, over here, what you are seeing is essentially particles rattling in the cage. It is believed that what is happening here are collections of three or four atoms that are kind of rotating in a bigger cage. So something, uh, the picture that people draw is three or four particles rotating around. Yes? Is there something weird about the part of the curve which is where energy is decreasing with increasing momentum? Uh, the, the transition between proton and proton? I there is no thermodynamic or other rule that says that the energy should be monotonic in momentum that I know. Yes? Is there a, um, an expression for that K naught in terms of like temperature and other properties of the system? Or? Uh, this curve of excitations is supposed to be a property of the ground state.
That is, you, you take the system in its ground state, and then you create an excitation that has some particular momentum, you calculate what the energy of that is. Uh, actually, this whole curve is phenomenological, because in order to get the excitations, you better have an ex expression for what the ground state is. And so writing a kind of wave function that describes the ground state of this interacting system is a very difficult task. Uh, I think Feynman has some variational type of uh, wave function that you can start and work with and then calculate things approximately in terms of that. Yes? What inspired Landau to propose that there was a, a, a pit? In the Actually, it was. Uh, not so much, I think, looking at this curve, but uh, which I think if you want to match that and that, you have to have something like this. But it was uh, really that the full experimental version of the heat capacity, it didn't seem like this expression was sufficient. And then there was uh, some amount of excitation and energy at the, at the temperatures where that were experimentally accessible that hinted at the presence of the rotund in the spectrum. Yes? So, so continuing up about the non-monotonic line, yeah. so if, if you raise the thermal energy KVT uh, to the level where you have multiple roots of yes. the curve, yes. uh, so you will be able to excite some states and, yes. and have some kind of gap, like a gap of momentum which are not OK, so at any finite temperatures, and we, I'll do the calculation for you shortly, there is a finite probability for exciting all of these ex uh, states. What you are saying is that then there is more occupation at this momentum compared to that, but much less compared to this. So that, again, is not particularly, uh, does not violate any condition. So it is. Uh, like, again, trying to shake this system of uh, particles. Let's imagine that you have grains, and you are trying to shake them. And it may be that at some shaking frequencies, then there are things that are taking place at short distances in addition to sound waves that you are generating. OK, yeah? I have a question about the methodology of getting this spectrum, because if we have uh, experimental result of the heat capacity, mm -hmm. then if we assume there's a spectrum, there has to be like this one, because it, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So yes. we can get uh, uh, we can uh, get the spectrum from directly from the C. So uh, uh, I'm not sure, because in reality, this is going to be spectrum in three-dimensional space. And uh, there is certainly an expression that relates the heat capacity to the excitation spectrum. What I'm not sure is whether mathematically that expression is uniquely invertible. It is given an epsilon C, you have a unique epsilon of P. Certainly given an epsilon of P, you have a unique C. Yes? But if the excitation spectrum only depends on, say, K squared, not on the three-dimensional components of K, yeah. then, then maybe it's much easier to go with the one first one. Okay. I don't know, because you have a function of temperature, and you want to convert it to a function of momentum that after some integrations will give you that function of temperature. Uh, I don't know the difficulty of mathematically doing that. I know that I, I can't off my head uh, think of an inversion formula. It's not like a function that you are inversing. Okay. All right. So the lambda spectrum can explain this part. It turns out that the lambda spectrum cannot explain this logarithmically divergent. Yes? Sorry, one more question about this. Uh, does the um, allowed values of k, the allowed values of k, do they get modified? Or are they thought to be the same? The uh, no. So basically, at some point, I have to change perspective from a sum over k to an integral over k or an integral over p. 
the density of states in momentum is something that is uh, kind of uh, invariant. It's, uh, it is a f very s slight function of shape, so that periodic boundary conditions and uh, uh, open boundary conditions, etc., give you something slightly different over here. But by the time you go to the continuum, it's a property of uh, dimension only. It doesn't really depend on the underlying shape. So we still change sums for integrals with the same rule? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a sort of uh, general density of state property. So there's some nice formula that tell you what the density of state is for an arbitrary shape. And the leading term is always proportional to volume or area with the density of state that we have been calculating. And then there are subleading terms that are proportional to if it is volume to area or edges, number of edges, etc. But those are kind of subleading in the thermodynamic sense. OK. So I guess. Uh, Feynman did a lot of work on formalizing these ideas of uh, uh, lambda getting some idea of what the ground state is, uh, is and the excitations that we can have about the spectrum. And so he was very happy with being able to uh, explain this, including the nature of rotons, etc. And he was worried that somehow he couldn't get this logarithmic divergence. And that bothered him a little bit, but uh, Onsager told him that that's really a much more fundamental property that depends on critical phenomena. And for resolving that issue, you have to come to A334. So we will not discuss that, nor we will we discuss why this is Tc minus T to the 2 thirds power and not a linear dependence. It again is one of these critical properties. But we should be able to explain this T to the fourth. And clearly, this t to the fourth is not as simple as saying, well, this exponent changed from 3 halves to 3. This 3 halves should also change to 3. No, it went to t to the fourth. So what's going on over here? So last time, at the end of the lecture, I wrote a statement that the uh, BEC is not superfluid. And what that really means is that it has too many excitations, low energy excitations. So imagine the following, that maybe we have a container. I don't know, maybe we have a tube. And we have our superfluid going through this with velocity v sub s. We wanted to maintain that velocity without experiencing friction, which it seems to do in going through these capillaries. You don't have to push it. It seems to be going by itself. And so the question is, can any of these pictures that we drew for excitations be consistent with this. Now, why am I talking about excitations and consistency with superflu? Because what can happen in principle is that uh, within your system, you can spontaneously generate some excitation. This excitation will have some momentum p and some energy epsilon of p. And if you spontaneously can create these excitations that would take away energy from this kinetic uh, energy of the flowing superfluid, gradually the superfluid will slow down. Its energy will be dissipated, and the superfluid itself will heat up because you generated these excitations within it. OK? So uh, let's see what happens. If I were to create such an excitation, actually, I have to worry about momentum conservation. 
because I created something that carried momentum p. Now, initially, let's say that this whole uh, entity, all of the fluid that are superflowing with velocity vs, have mass m. So the initial momentum would be m vs. Now I created something, some excitation that is carrying away some momentum p. So the only thing that can ensure this happens is that I have to slightly change the velocity of the fluid. Okay? Now this change in velocity is infinitesimal. It is Vs minus P divided by M. M is huge. You say why bother thinking about this? Well let's see what the change in energy is. Delta E. You'd say, well, you created this excitation, so you have energy epsilon of p. But I say, in addition to that, there is a change in the kinetic energy of the superfluid. I'm now moving at Vs prime squared, whereas initially, when this excitation was not present, I was moving at Vs. And so what do we have here? We have epsilon of p, m over 2, vs minus p over m, this infinitesimal change in velocity squared, minus m over 2 vs squared. We can see that the leading order, the kinetic energy, goes away. But that there is a cross term here in which the m contribution, the contribution of the mass, uh, goes away. And so the change in energy is actually something like this. So if I had a system that when stationary, the energy to create an excitation of momentum p was epsilon of p, when I put that in a frame that is moving with some velocity vs, you have the ability to borrow some of that kinetic energy, and the excitation energy goes down by this amount. Okay. So. What happens if I take the Bose-Einstein type of excitation spectrum that is p squared over 2m, and then subtract a v dot s from it, uh, a v dot p from it? Essentially, there is a linear subtraction going on. And I would get the curve such as this. So I probably exaggerated this by a lot. I shouldn't have subtracted so much. Let me actually not subtract so much because don't want to go all the way in that range. Okay, But you can see that there is a range of momenta where you would spontaneously gain energy by creating excitations if the spectrum was initially p squared over 2m, basically you just have too many low energy excitations. As soon as you start moving it, you will spontaneously excite these things. Even if you were initially at zero temperature, these phonon excitations would be created spontaneously in your system. They would move all over the place. They would heat up your system. There is no way that you can pass the Bose-Einstein condensate. Actually, there's no way that you can even move it without losing energy. Okay? But you can see that this red curve does not have that difficulty. If I were to shift this curve by an amount that is linear, what do I get? I will get something like this. Okay? 
Okay? So the Lando spectrum is perfectly fine as far as uh, uh, excitations is concerned. At zero temperature, even if the uh, whole fluid is moving, then it cannot spontaneously create excitations because you would increase energy of the system. OK? So there is this difference. Ultimately, you would say that the first time you would get uh, 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 excitations if you move it fast enough so that some portion of this curve goes to 0. And indeed, if you were to try to stir or move a superfluid fast enough, there is a velocity at which it breaks down. It stops being a superfluid. But it turns out that that velocity is much, much smaller than you would predict based on this roton spectrum going down. There are some other many body excitations that come before and cause the superfluid to lose energy and break down. But the generic idea as to why uh, a linear spectrum for k equals to 0 is consistent with superfluidity, but the quadratic one is not, remains correct. OK, now suppose I am in this situation. I have a moving superfluid, such as the one that I have described over here. The spectrum is going to be somewhat like this. But I'm not at zero temperature. I want to try to describe this t to the fourth behavior, so I want to be at some finite temperature. So if I'm at some finite temperature, there is some probability to excite these different states. And the number that would correspond to some momentum p would be given by this uh, general formula that we have, 1 over uh, z inverse e to the beta epsilon of p minus 1. And furthermore, if I think that I am in the regime, where the number of excitations is not important because of the same reason that I had for the Bose-Einstein condensate, I would have this formula, except that I would use epsilon of p that is appropriate to this system. Actually, what is appropriate to this system is that my epsilon of p was uh, velocity times p. But then I started to move with this superfluid velocity. Actually, maybe I'll call this C so that I have a distinction between C, which is the linear spectrum here, and the superfluid velocity dot P. Okay. Now, this is actually a vectorial product. Okay, And because of that, I mean, I only drew one part of this curve that corresponds to mo positive momentum. If I had gone to negative momentum, actually, this curve would have continued. And whereas one branch, the energy is reduced, if I go to minus p, the energy goes up. So whereas if the superfluid was not moving, I can generate as many excitations with momentum p as momentum minus p. Once the superfluid is moving, the, there is a this, the difference. One of them has a v dot p, the other has minus v dot p. So because of that, there is a net momentum that is carried by these excitations. This net momentum is obtained by summing over all of these things multiplying with the appropriate momentum. So I have beta is Cp minus D dot P minus 1. This is the momentum of the excitation. This is the net momentum of the system for one excitation. But then I have to sum over all possible Ps. Sum over Ps, as we've discussed, I can replace with an integral. 
and sum over k be replaced with v integral over k, k and p are simply related by a factor of h bar. So whereas before for k I had 2 pi cubed, for d cubed I have 2 pi h bar cubed. Okay? So this is what I have to calculate. Now what happens for small v? I can make an expansion in Vs. The zero to order term in the expansion is what we have, would have for non-moving fluid. The momenta in the two directions are the same, so that that contribution goes away. The first contribution that I'm going to get is going to come from expanding this to lowest order in P. So when I there's a P that is sitting out front. When I make the expansion, I will get a Vs dot P times the derivative of the exponential function. Gives me a factor of beta e to the beta uh, Cp. And down here, I will have e to the beta Cp minus 1 squared. Okay. Now, in the problem set, you had to actually evaluate this integral. It's not that difficult. It's related to zeta functions. But what I'm really only interested in is what is the temperature dependence. You can see that I can rescale this combination, call it x. Essentially, what it says is that whenever I see a factor of p, replace it by kt over Cx. And how many p's do I have? I have 3, 4, 5. So I have 5 factors of p. So I will have 5 factors of kt. One of them gets killed by the beta. So this whole thing is proportional to t to the fourth power. So what have we found? We have found that the, as this fluid is moving at some finite temperature t, it will generate these excitations. And these excitations are preferably along the direction of the momentum. And they correspond to an additional momentum of the fluid that is proportional to the volume. It's proportional to temperature to the fourth and something. And of course, proportional to the velocity. Now we are used to thinking of the proportionality of momentum and velocity to be some kind of a mass. If I divide that mass by the volume, I have a density of these excitations. And what we have established is that the density of those excitations is proportional to t to the fourth. And what is happening in this Andronikashvili experiment is that as these plates are moving, by this mechanism, the superfluid that is in contact with them will create excitations. And the momentum of those excitations would correspond to some kind of a density that vanishes as t to the fourth, again, in uh, agreement with what we've seen here. OK? Yes? Uh, so in your integral expression, you have Vs as part of the dot product. Yes. Um, and then in the next line, we right. have Vs. So is okay. it in that direction? So or? let's give these indices, p in direction alpha. This is p in direction alpha. This is p in direction alpha. This is v in direction beta, p in direction beta, sum over beta. OK? Now, I have to do an ang angular integration that is spherically symmetric. And then somewhere inside there, it has a p alpha, p beta. 
that integration will give me a p squared, angular integration will give me a p squared over 3 delta alpha beta, which then converts this v beta to a v alpha, which is in the direction of the moment. Yes? OK, so when we are in the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate, as far as the excitations are concerned, uh, we have zero chemical potential. Whatever number of particles that we have in excess of what can be accommodated through the excitations, we put together in the ground state. So if you like the ground state, the k p equals to 0 or k equals to 0, is a reservoir. You can add as many particles there or bring as many particles out of it as you like. So effectively, you have no conservation number and no need for a z. Yes? Okay. Of course, that we only know for the case of the true Bose-Einstein condensate. We are kind of jumping and giving that concept relevance for the uh, interacting superfluid. OK? Any other questions? OK, so this is actually the last item I wanted to cover for uh, going on the board. The rest of the hour. We have this movie that I had promised you. Uh, I will read that movie run. I also have all the connection of uh, problem sets and exams and tests that you have not picked up. So while the movie runs, you're welcome to sit and enjoy it. It's very nice. Or you can go and pick your stuff and go your own way or do whatever you like. OK, so let's go back. There will be more action. <laughs>
walk home and be very mentally equipped. It is a remarkable transition. It has two different and easily distinguishable liquid phases, a warmer and a colder one. The warmer phase is called liquid helium 1, and the colder phase, liquid helium 2. The two phases are separated by a transition temperature, known as the lambda point. When liquid helium is cooled down through the lambda point, a transition from helium 1 to helium 2 is clearly visible. We will show it to you later in this film. The two liquids behave nothing like any other known liquid, although it could be said that helium-1, the warmer phase, approximates the behavior of common liquids. But it is helium-2, the colder phase, which is truly different. Because of this, it is called the superfluid. The temperatures involved when working with liquid helium are quite low. Helium boils at 4.2 degrees Kelvin, under conditions of atmospheric pressure. And the lambda point lies at roughly 2.2 degrees. Note that this corresponds to minus 269 and minus 271 degrees centigrade. The properties of liquid helium that I have just been telling you about are characteristic of the heavy isotope of helium, helium-4. The element occurs in the form of two stable isotopes. The isotope. The second and lighter one, helium-3, is very rare. Its abundance is only about one part of 10 million. Pure liquid helium-3 is the subject of intensive study at the present time, but so far no second superfluid liquid phase has been found to exist for helium-3. The low temperature at which we'll be working call for well-insulated containers. The doer meets our requirements. The word doer is the scientific name given to a double-walled vessel where the space between the walls evacuated. When these doers are made of glass, the surface of this inner space is usually silvered to cut down heat transfer by radiation. However, our doers will have to be transparent so that we can look at what's going on inside. Now, liquid helium is commonly stored in double doors. The design is quite simple. Just put one inside the other. <laughs> like this. In the inner door, we put the liquid helium. And in the space between the inner and outer door, we maintain a supply of liquid air. Here is the double door, exactly like the one we will be using in our demonstration experiment. The inner door is filled with liquid helium. The outer door contains liquid air. The normal boiling temperature of liquid air is about 80 degrees Kelvin, 75 or more degrees hotter than the liquid helium. The purpose of the liquid air is twofold. First, we put the liquid air in the outer door well ahead of putting liquid helium in the inner door. In this way, the inner door is pre-cooled. Secondly, we maintain a supply of liquid air in the outer door because it provides an additional mantle of insulation now that the liquid helium is in the inner door. The boiling liquid air attests to the fact that it is absorbing some of the heat which enters the double door. Even with the boiling of the liquid air, the liquid helium is clearly visible. Later, we will use liquid air cooled below its boiling temperature to reduce or eliminate the air bubbles for better visibility. Now the liquid air is cooled down and we have eliminated boiling. The smaller bubbles of the boiling liquid helium are clearly visible. The color over the inner door has a port. At present open, the liquid helium is at atmospheric pressure. So, its temperature is 4.2 degrees Kelvin. In other words, what we have in here now is liquid helium-1, the warmer of the two phases. Before we cool it down to take a look at the superfluid phase, I want to dwell briefly on the properties of helium-1. I have told you before that even helium-1 is different from the normal liquid. 
The distance between neighboring atoms in this liquid is quite large. The atoms are not as closely packed as in the classical liquids. The reason for this is quantum mechanics. The zero-point energy is relatively more important here than in any other liquid. As a consequence, liquid helium has a very low mass density, only about 13% the density of water, and a very low optical density. The index of refraction is quite close to one. This makes its surface hard to see with the naked eye under ordinary lighting conditions. You are no doubt familiar with the fact that the helium atom has closed shell atomic structure. This explains why helium is a chemically inert element. It also accounts for the fact that the force of attraction between neighboring helium atoms, the so-called van der Waals force, is small. It takes little energy to pull two helium atoms apart, as for example, in evaporation. This gives liquid helium a very small latent heat of vaporization. Only five calories are needed to evaporate one gram. Compare this with water, where evaporation requires between five and six hundred calories per gram. The low van der Waals force combined with a large zero-point energy also account for the fact that liquid helium does not freeze, cannot be solidified at ordinary pressure, no matter how far we cool it. However, liquid helium has been solidified at high pressure. The liquid helium in the Dewar is at 4.2 degrees. We now want to cool it down to the Lambda point and show you the transition to the superfluid phase. Our method will be cooling by evaporation using a vacuum pump. Now, the lambda point lies at 2.2 degrees, only 2 degrees colder than the present temperature of the liquid. What's more, not very much heat has to be removed from the liquid helium now in the door to bring it to the lambda point. It amounts to only about 250 calories. Nevertheless, don't get the idea that this cooling process is easy. On the contrary, it's quite difficult. More than one-third of the liquid helium now in the doer has to be dumped away in vapor form before we can get what remains behind to the lambda point. That requires an awful lot of pumping and explains <laughs> why we use this large and powerful vacuum pump over here. <laughs> Even with this sum, the cooling process takes a considerable amount of time. Liquid helium rises astonishingly 
as we approach 2.17 degrees, the lambda point. The heat of vaporization, on the other hand, remains roughly the same. So, a given amount of vapor carried off produces less and less cooling as we approach 2.17 degrees. Our thermometer here is a low pressure gauge connected to the space above the liquid helium. The needle registers the pressure there. It is the saturated vapor pressure of liquid helium. The gauge is calibrated to the corresponding temperature. We call it a vapor pressure thermometer. As we approach 2.17 degrees, boiling becomes increasingly violent. Suddenly it stops. This was the transition. The liquid you now see is helium-2. Even though evaporation does continue, there is no boiling. The normal liquids, such as the water in this beaker, boil because of their relatively low heat conductivity. Before heat, that is at one point, can be carried away to a cooler place in the liquid, bubbles of the vapor form. Helium-1 behaves like a normal liquid in this respect. The absence of boiling in helium-2 reveals that this phase acts as if it had a large heat conductivity. As a matter of fact, as the liquid helium passed through the lambda point transition you just saw, its heat conductivity increased by the fantastic factor of one million. The heat conductivity of helium-2 is many times greater than in the metal <coughs> silver and copper, which are among the best solid heat conductors. And yet, here we deal with a liquid. For this alone, helium-2 deserves the name of superfluid. Actually, the way in which helium-2 transports such large quantities of heat so rapidly is totally different from the classical concept for heat conduction. I'll come back to the subject later in connection with an experiment demonstrating the phenomenon of second sound in helium-2. Remember that this great change in heat conductivity occurs at a single, a fixed transition temperature, the lambda point. We do indeed deal with a change in phase, only here it is a change from one liquid to another liquid. As we told you before, the specific heat of liquid helium is very large at the lambda point. In fact, it behaves abnormally even below the lambda point and falls again very rapidly with the temperature. This discontinuity in specific heat is another reflection of the fact that we are dealing with a change in the phase of the substance. By the way, the curve resembles the Greek letter lambda. The transition temperature got its name from the shape of this curve. <coughs> For more surprises, the next one has to do with the viscosity of liquid helium. When a normal liquid flows through a tube, it will resist the flow. In this experiment, we shall cause some glycerin to flow through a tube under its own weight. The top layer is colored glycerin. The liquid layer closest to the tube wall adheres to it. The layer next in from the one touching the wall flows by it and is retarded as it flows due to the interatomic, the van der Waals force of attraction. The second layer, in turn, drags on the third and so on inward from the wall, producing fluid friction or viscosity. The narrower the tube, the slower the liquid rate of flow through it under a given head of pressure. Here I have a beaker with an unglazed ceramic bottom of ultrafine porosity. Many capillary channels run through this ceramic disc. Their diameter is quite small, about one micron, which is one ten thousandth of a centimeter. There is liquid helium in the beaker. It is at 4.2 degrees Kelvin. Helium-1, the normal phase. The capillaries in the disc are fine enough to prevent the liquid now in the beaker from flowing through under its own weight. Clearly, helium-1 is viscous. To be sure, its viscosity is very small. That's why we had to choose extremely fine capillaries to demonstrate it. 
here you see the lambda point transition. The helium-2 all poured out. The rate of pouring would not be noticeably slower if the porosity were made yet finer. We call this kind of flow a superflow. The temperature is now at 1.6 degrees. The superflow is even faster. The viscosity of helium-2 in this experiment is so small that it had not been possible to find a value for it. It is less than the experimental uncertainty incurred in attempts to measure it. We now believe that helium-2, the superfluid, has zero viscosity, although we should be more precise here. We believe its viscosity is zero when observing capillary flow. Bear this statement in mind, for we will come up with a contradiction to it in the next experiment, where we will look for viscosity by a different method. There is a copper cylinder in the liquid helium, so mounted that we can turn it about a vertical axis. In order to turn it smoothly, and with as little vibration as possible, we make the cylinder into the armature of a simple induction motor, energized from outside the doer. The four horizontal coils you see provide the torque which turns the cylinder. The liquid helium is electrically non-conducting. The coils exert no torque on it directly. Yes. As we turn on our motor, the liquid layer bounding the cylinder is dragged along by it. The boundary layer in turn drags on the next layer, and so on outward. Finally, a circulation shows up in the helium due to its own viscosity, and the wooden paddle wheel is turned along. What we have just seen occurred in helium-1, the normal phase, at 4.2 degrees Kelvin. That is to say, this demonstration is consistent with our results for helium-1 by capillary flow. Helium-1 is viscous. Here you see the liquid cooled down and passing into the superfluid phase, helium-2. again. What does this mean? First of all, <laughs> let me emphasize that, like helium-1, helium-2 is also non-conducting in the electrical sense. In other words, the circulation in the experiment can only have been caused through viscous drag. So we conclude, from the rotating cylinder observations, that helium-2 is viscous, and from the method of capillary flow, that it has zero <laughs> Our experimentation has come up with a paradox. No normal classical liquid is known to behave so inconsistently in capillary flow on the one hand and in bulk flow on the other. This state of affairs forces us to think of helium-2, the superfluid, not as a single, but as a dual liquid. It appears as if helium-2 had two separate and yet interpenetrating component liquids. We shall call one component normal. It is this component which we hold responsible for the appearance of viscosity below the lambda point in the rotating cylinder experiment. The normal component, as the name suggests, behaves like a normal liquid and therefore has viscosity. It is the one which the cylinder drags along as it turns. But the normal component cannot flow through the narrow channels of the ceramic disk because of its viscosity. The second component has zero viscosity, and it's called the superfluid component. We think that it does not participate at all in the rotating cylinder experiment below the lambda point. It stays at rest. On the other hand, it can flow through channels of one micron diameter with the greatest of ease, encountering no resistance whatever, because it has no viscosity. As we'll see later, this flow is not impeded even when the capillary diameters are made far smaller than one micron.
This soft construction is called the two fluid model for liquid medium tube. Whether it is correct or not depends on further tests comparing the theory based on this model with experimental results. We now go on to another phenomenon, the fountain effect. What you see here is a tube which narrows down and then opens into a bulb. A small piece of cotton is stuffed into the constriction between the tube and the bulb. And the bulb has been tightly packed with one of the finest powders available, two of those rules. A second wad of cotton keeps the powder in the bulb. This powder presents extremely fine capillary channels. Their average diameter is a small fraction of one micron. This device has been placed in the tour. The liquid helium is below the lambda point. We submerge the bulb, and then we'll send a beam of light from this lamp to a point near the top. You will see the light beam when the lamp is turned on. It focuses some heat in the form of infrared radiation on the point in question. The temperature will rise above the temperature of the rest of the apparatus. Let us turn it on. Liquid helium flows through the hole in the bottom of the bulb, through the fine powder, and rises above the level of liquid helium outside. The height to which it will go depends on the temperature increase produced by the lamp focused on the bulb. We can very well ask, where does the mechanical energy come from that does the work necessary to pump the liquid above the ambient level? Before we attempt to discuss this question, there are two other facts that should be noted. The first is by now obvious. The upward flow through the bulb must clearly be a superflow. Only the superfluid component of helium-2 could get through. The second fact is more significant. Let me explain it this way. The superfluid flows spontaneously from A to B, from a cooler to a warmer place. Point A is in the cold liquid, but B is being heated with infrared rays. The second law of thermodynamics positively says that heat cannot of itself flow from a point of lower to a point of higher temperature. What does this mean to us here, knowing as we do that the superfluid is flowing from a colder to a warmer spot? Simply this, it carries no heat, no thermal energy. Any internal energy it may still possess is no longer thermally available. To say it precisely, it has zero entropy. We have discovered another remarkable property of helium-2. Its superfluid component not only is friction-free, it also contains no heat. The heat energy contained in helium-2 as a whole resides, all of this, in the normal component. We may, of course, add heat to the superfluid component, as we are doing when it passes the spot heated by the lamp. But in doing so, we are converting it into the normal component. Let me return briefly to a question posed earlier. Mechanical work is done in pumping the liquid above equilibrium level. Where does it come from? I cannot answer this question here in full, but it suffice to tell you that we are dealing here with a heat engine. The mechanical energy comes from the heat added at the light spot. An amusing demonstration of the same phenomenon again uses a bulb packed with rouge, but this one opens into a capillary. Light is beamed on a spot just below the capillary, and it produces a helium fountain. The phenomenon in this and the previous experiment has become known as the thermomechanical or the fountain effect. Below the lambda point, the superfluid component of liquid helium creeps up along the wall of its container in an extremely thin film. It is known as the Robin film. This creeping film is a variety of superflow. It is difficult to make the film itself directly visible to you. To show it indirectly, we put some liquid helium into a glass vessel. It is below the lambda point. There is no porous bottom in this vessel. 
The film rises along the inside wall and comes down along the outside, collecting in drops at the bottom. The thickness of this creeping film is only a small fraction of one micron and of the order of two to three hundred angstroms. Its speed, while small just below the lambda point, may reach a value as high as 35 centimeters per second at lower temperatures. Our next experiment deals with the phenomenon of second sound. We are all familiar with wave motion in elastic materials, be they solids, liquids, or gases. Elastic energy of deformation carried away from a source in the form of wave with a characteristic speed, the speed of sound. Liquid helium is an elastic substance, both above and below the lambda point. Both helium 1 and 2 support sound waves. Now, helium 2, the superfluid phase, also conducts heat in the form of waves. This remarkable property is shared by no other substance. For better or for worse, it has been called second sound. Normal heat conduction is a diffusion process. The rate of flow of heat is proportional to the temperature differences. But in helium-2, it is a wave process. Heat flows through helium-2 with a characteristic speed, the speed of second sound. We shall send small heat pulses into helium-2 from a heater. They will spread away from the heater uniformly, carrying the heat energy with them. The speed of second sound is small just below the lambda point. In the neighborhood of 1.6 degrees Kelvin, it reaches a value of roughly 20 meters per second, and it is in this range that we will run our demonstration. The experimental procedure is as follows. There are two discs in the liquid helium. They are carbon resistors, with the carbon applied in thin layers on one side of each disc. In this way, good thermal contact is established between the resistor and the liquid helium. The volume resistor will be used as a heater. Electric current will be sent through it in pulses from this pulse generator by means of the cable you see here. The output of the generator is also connected via a second cable to a dual tray oscilloscope where it will be recorded on the bottom tray. In other words, it will record the heat pulse as it enters the liquid helium. The pulses have been turned on. They themselves trigger the horizontal sweep of the trays, which records time elapsed. It is calibrated at one millisecond per unit on the scale. The pulses are one millisecond long. The pulses leave the heater at the bottom in the form of second sound and move up to where they strike the carbon resistor at the top. Being heat pulses, they briefly raise its temperature. The carbon resistor is quite sensitive to changes in temperature. It acts as a thermometer. So the heat pulse of second sound creates a pulse-like change in the resistance of the disc up here. It isn't hard to convert this resistance pulse into a voltage pulse, but we will do it to maintain a small DC current in the top resistor. It is supplied from a battery in this metal box. The box shields the circuit in order to reduce electronic noise. The voltage pulse is small. In this second box, we have an amplifier. The amplifier output is fed into the oscilloscope where it will appear on the upper tray. The horizontal time scale on this tray is exactly the same as for the bottom tray. However, the upper tray records voltage changes as they occur in the top resistor, the detector of second sound. The temperature of the liquid is about 1.65 degrees Kelvin.
This pulse in the upper trace is also about one millisecond long. It is the second sound as it arrives at the upper resistor. The upper trace also shows a strong voltage pulse at the left, simultaneous with the heater pulse. That's due to pick up by electromagnetic waves with the heater acting as transmitter and the detector as receiver. We are moving the detector towards the heater. The pulse moves with it to the left. Note the echoes of second sound which appear on the upper train while the detector is near the heater. They are caused by multiple reflection between the two resistors. A total of three echoes is clearly visible. Okay, you can watch the rest of it at home.